Hello folks, I am Manuel from today's news. I will be reading and speaking about world news, interesting news, news to keep you entertained, and news to keep you informed. And everything I'll, I'll have on here will be down in the, uh, there'll be a link in the uh, description box for you. And you can fast forward to any, anything you want to hear about. And what I got for you today first is from uh, CNN Business. This is dated uh, April 25th, 2023. Banks aren't out of the woods after the collapse of SVB and uh, Signature. New York CNN. A month ago, code blue sirens went off at banks across the globe after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. As banks work to put that painful episode in the rearview mirror, it's unclear if the situation has stabilized or if it's the calm before another storm. More details will come on Friday, when the Federal Reserve is set to release the findings of its investigation into what led to SVB's collapse. For now, looking at banks' deposits may lead you to believe that banks are in better shape than they are, but they are not out of the woods just yet, said Anna Arsav, Managing Director at Moody's. After the collapse of SVB and Signature Bank record levels of deposits poured into Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase and Citibank from midsize and regional banks. First Republic Bank reported that its total deposits fell 41% in the first quarter, to $104.5 billion. But deposit activity has been stable since the end of March, the bank's CEO Michael Roffler said on an earnings call Monday. That's the case across U.S. banks both large and small, according to Federal Reserve banking data. As of April 21, total deposits at First Republic, including the $30 billion infusion it received from large banks, stood at $102.7 billion, down 1.7% from the end of March. The minor decline reflects seasonal client tax payments, Roffler said. Fed rate hikes will continue to test banks. The Federal Reserve's year-long rate hiking campaign, aimed at taming inflation, partly accelerated the banking crisis. The Fed raises interest rates by selling assets, namely treasury bills. When it does so, the price of bonds tends to fall while yields rise. SVB ran into trouble because too many of its customers' funds were locked into bonds. That became a problem when depositors, mostly startups and other tech companies, needed to withdraw more money as other sources of funding dried up. To meet their withdrawal requests, SVB had to sell bonds at an almost $2 billion loss. And there's more to read on it if you want to read about it. Yeah, uh, the banks don't keep all your money in cash. You got bonds, uh, and what happened with them does, is that uh, people was, you know, uh, business was was starting up, and they need funds, and uh, the bank, and they were trying to get the money out of the bank, and the bank said they have it. So, but anyway, you can read the rest of this in my description box. Let's go to the next one here. This from Newsmax: House passes Republican bill tightening border security. The House of Representatives on Thursday approved Republican legislation intended to stop immigrants and illegal drugs crossing the nation's southwestern border with Mexico, leaving it to the Senate to attempt a broader, bipartisan immigration bill. The package, which Democrats have warned will be blocked in the Senate, would set tight limits on asylum seekers and require them to apply for U.S. protection outside the country. It also would resume construction of a wall along the border and expand federal law enforcement efforts. The House voted 219 to 213 to pass the bill, with no Democrats in favor and one Republican opposed. The key component of this bill is where we say, if you come to our country, you will get to, according to the law, file your asylum claim, but you will be detained or you will be returned while your claim is adjudicated, said House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan during debate on the bill. The vote occurred in anticipation of the Thursday midnight expiration of the Title 42 immigration restriction that began under former President Donald Trump in 2020 at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. It has allowed U.S. authorities to expel migrants to Mexico without the chance to seek asylum, citing health concerns. Officials at the southwestern border were seeing large influxes of immigrants in the final days of Title 42 expiration. My Republican colleagues are trying to take us back to the failed, illegal and immoral policies of the Trump administration, said Rep. Gerald Nadler, the senior Democrat on the Judiciary Panel. This bill serves as a wholesale ban on asylum. No one would be able to seek asylum in the United States if they cross between ports of entry or if they had or could have had even temporary status in a third country, Nadler added. 
While the House bill is not expected to get to President Joe Biden's desk for signing into law, there are hopes in the Senate that it will spark negotiations for a bipartisan, comprehensive border security and immigration reform measure in coming months. And you can read the rest of this in my description box. This is an article from yesterday. Uh, I haven't heard anything what happens today after they open the border. So, let me go to my next one here. This is uh, from, from uh, Newsmax. Reverend Graham's, Graham said, Trump's trial designed to tarnish him. The Reverend Franklin Graham condemned a jury's decision to find Donald Trump liable for sexual abuse and said it was another attempt to tarnish the former president. Graham, president of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, posted on Facebook Wednesday to his 10 million followers, it is disappointing that our legal system has become so politicized. The former president is being accused of something 30 years ago, and reports say that his accuser can't recall the month or the year. Graham, who also heads up the nonprofit charity Samaritan's Purse, added, This civil trial with a price tag in the millions seems to be nothing more than another attempt to tarnish the former president, plant doubts, and destroy his ability to run for office again. His enemies will stop at nothing. Pray for our nation. We need God's help. A jury found Trump liable Tuesday for sexually abusing advice columnist E. Jean Carroll in 1996, awarding her $5 million in a judgment that could haunt the former president as he campaigns to regain the White House, according to the Associated Press. The verdict was announced in a federal courtroom in New York City on the first day of jury deliberations. Jurors rejected Carroll's claims that she was raped, but found Trump liable for sexually abusing her. Trump has insisted he never sexually assaulted Carol or even knew her. This woman, I don't know her, he said at a CNN town hall on Wednesday. I never met her. I have no idea who she is. And what I think is that this uh, Jean Carroll, she w was hurting for money and then she had an, an ideal, you know, back 30 years ago, you know, why not try to get Trump on rape, you know. A lot of this stuff is, you know, you're going to hear more about it, you know, from other people and stuff. You know, it's it's going to go on. People are going to be hurting for money and they're going to try to sue people for anything. And the reason uh, Trump had to pay that $5 million is what I think is that, you know, Trump is a Republican. Uh, New York is a Democratic state. All the jurors probably are uh, uh, Democrats. You know, he, it, it's like th throwing piece, throwing uh, s something in the bonfire. You know, the bonfire is a Democrat, and 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 whatever you throw in the bonfire is is Republican. You know, he have, he he can't he can't win that way. <laughs> this you know, our country is going to hell in a handbasket. It is, and it's going to get worse. We got to straighten up these politicians fast. Let's go to the next one. This one here from a uh, uh, political uh, insider. It says Trump defends uh, Patriot Ashley Babbitt at town hall, slams officer who killed her as a thug. Donald Trump defended Ashley Babbitt as a patriot and slammed the police officer who shot and killed her as a thug during Wednesday's CNN town hall event. Babbitt, a Trump supporter and Air Force veteran, was the only person killed during the January 6th Capitol riot when she was gunned down by Capitol Police Officer Lt. Michael Byrd. Town Hall moderator Kaitlin Collins pointed out that over 140 officers were injured during the course of the riot. And a person named Ashley Babbitt was killed, Trump countered. And she shouldn't have been killed. And that thug that killed her, there was no reason to shoot her, the former president continued. She was a good person. She was a patriot. There was no reason. Relate. Trump hammers officer who killed Ashley Babbitt. Trump, the leading candidate for the Republican nomination for president in 2024, and, currently, the leading candidate overall, continued to criticize Byrd for his reaction after the shooting of Ashley Babbitt. He went on television to brag about the fact that he killed her, he accused. Collins countered that the officer wasn't bragging about his actions but Trump wasn't having it saying, oh, he was bragging. 
And there's a little more to read about this. Uh, let me go to this video right here. I watched it yesterday. Your name has been battered about on the internet, but you've never been officially publicly identified. Do you want to tell us who you are? Uh, my name is Michael Bird. I'm a lieutenant for the United States Capitol Police. For months, he has lived in hiding, he says, over this moment. His decision to use deadly force against a rioter as she climbed through a barricaded door that leads to the House chamber. In the months since, he's been the target of threats. Can you give us the nature of some of those threats? They talked about, you know, killing me, uh, cutting off my head, um, you know, very vicious and cruel things. Racist things? There were some racist attacks as well. It's all disheartening because I know I was doing my job. Given the nature of the threats that you describe, do you have any concern about showing your face and identifying yourself? Of course I do. Uh, that is a very vital point, and it's something that uh, is frightening. I believe I showed the uh, utmost courage on January 6th, and it's time for me to do that now. Responsible that day for securing the House chambers, Byrd couldn't see what Americans were witnessing on their TVs, but he could hear it in the pleas from other officers. Were you afraid that day? I was very afraid. What are you hearing on your radio? I'm hearing about the breaches of different uh, barricaded areas, uh, officers being overrun, officers being down. Did you ever hear a call or a report of shots fired during any of this? As a matter of fact, I did. There was reports of shots fired through the house main door onto the floor of the chamber. Later, those reports would prove to be false. This video captures Byrd instructing members of Congress to don gas masks. We got a disbursement of tear gas in the rotunda. Please be advised their masks. Okay, that's all I'm going to play on that one there. You can watch the rest of the, uh, the video. And um, this, this cop, he shot this girl, was crawling through a broken window. She didn't have no gun. She's a veteran, Air Force veteran. And he didn't bother to see if, if she's going to have a weapon first. You know, he, he was so scared. He shouldn't even be a cop. And um, he, he just shot first. You know what I'm saying? Don't shoot until you see the whites of your eyes. Well, he, he didn't wait for that. You know, now, if this was a white cop and that was a black woman, then the cop will be in trouble. But since he's a black cop, He's not going to get in trouble. He's in a democratic state. Tell me what you think about it. Yeah, let's go to the next one. This is pissing me off. This is from Fox News. Treasury budget uh, numbers show Biden's using scare tactics. There's no risk of default. President Joe Biden met with congressional leaders Tuesday, May 9th, to discuss the debt ceiling and the unsustainable level of government spending. The House of Representatives already passed a bill that pairs reasonable spending cuts with a debt ceiling increase, but the Biden administration is more interested in scare tactics than solutions. For weeks before the meeting, Biden and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen tried to set the stage by saying that failing to raise the debt ceiling would necessitate a default, but the math says that's not true, not by a long shot. Nevertheless, the Biden administration has gone all in on the specter of default as a scare tactic to bully conservatives into caving on the issue. And while Yellen is right that the X date, the day the Treasury's cash account falls to zero, will arrive in the coming weeks, that would not be catastrophic. In fact, it's happened plenty of times before. When the Treasury runs out of cash and isn't allowed to borrow more, the government has typically just had a partial shutdown. That is a world different from defaulting on the debt. To cover its deficits, the Treasury issues debt, bills, notes, and bonds, and promises to repay those borrowings with interest. If the Treasury fails to do so, like missing a payment on a mortgage or credit card, that is a default. The Treasury has the ability to prioritize payments, and its own data released on Wednesday show it has more than enough revenue coming in to service the debt and avoid a default in the event the debt ceiling isn't raised. Cumulative revenue in the current fiscal year is $2.687 trillion, while net interest on the debt comes to $364 billion. 
While it's shocking that the treasury is paying so much to service the debt, the fact is revenue is over seven times what is needed to avoid a default. In fact, major government programs could still be funded in the event of a partial government shutdown. Cumulative outlays in the current fiscal year for Social Security, Medicare and Veterans Benefits and Services are $770 billion, $426 billion and $157 billion, respectively. That means the Treasury would still have enough money to both pay for these programs and service the debt, all from existing revenue, without the need to issue any new debt. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. You can read the rest of this on my, in my uh, description box with the link. And let's go to the next one. Here's one from Fox News. Democrats and independent voters alarmed over new allegations against Biden family could be uh, treacherous. The latest allegations from House Republicans have put more pressure on a growing scandal surrounding the Biden family. While many Republicans have long questioned Hunter Biden's financial dealings, Democrats and independents are also voicing concerns about the president's involvement in his son's overseas business affairs. It's completely unethical, independent voter Mary Josephine Generoso said during a Fox and Friends discussion with a bipartisan group of voters Thursday. You have foreign nationals funneling money into an LLC, then being dispersed to the Biden family. I mean, it's basically unethical. It's a national security threat. It could be treasonous, as far as I'm concerned. During a press conference Wednesday, House Oversight Committee Chairman Rep. James Comer, Republican Kentucky, and a panel of other members said they believe President Biden has been involved in his family's foreign business dealings from the very beginning, telling reporters that lawmakers are only in the beginning stages of their investigation. Comer listed the Biden family members who received funds, including Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, Joe Biden's brother's wife, Hunter Biden's girlfriend, or Beau Biden's widow, however, want to write that, Hunter Biden's ex-wife, Hunter Biden's current wife and three children of the president's son and the president's brother. And there's more to read on that if you want to read the rest of it. Uh, so a link here. That here Comer says, Biden involved in family business dealings, brother, grandkids, Hunter, and his wives all got paid. That's a link there if you want to read that. I got a lot of news to go through here. Now we go into the next one here. This is from the Washington Examiner. Once again, Eric Solwell was caught peddling misinformation. Representative Eric Swalwell, Democrat California, has repeatedly declared his disdain for the spread of disinformation. However, he is consistently one of the many Democratic legislators guilty of doing it. On Monday, the California legislator falsely claimed that former President Donald Trump had been convicted of sexual assault. Donald Trump has been convicted of sexual assault, Swalwell tweeted. And, House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy is all in with his sexually abusive pal. Swalwell's tweet was completely wrong and even potentially libelous. Trump was not and has not ever been convicted of sexual assault. Rather he was found liable for battery and defamation. The two things are very different. Swalwell Swalwell's false statement was so egregious that he was viciously mocked by social media accounts throughout the country. Sarah Arnold from townhall.com chronicled much of the pushback against the representative of California's 14th congressional district. Many ridiculed Swalwell for lying or being ignorant. Representative Eric Swalwell, Democrat California, fell into another trap of mockery after making false accusations about former President Trump, Arnold wrote. Fact-checkers quickly pointed out the noticeable mistake Swalwell made when trying to bash Trump and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Republican California. Consider some of Swalwell's other lies. In January, he tweeted that he was being removed from his congressional committees out of vengeance. He claimed Republicans had a vendetta against him, and that was the primary reason he was being removed. He even claimed some Republicans went on political shows and stated as much. On January 10, Swalwell tweeted, Breaking, Republic at Byron Donalds admits on at their rideout that at Speaker McCarthy is kicking me, at Rep Adam Schiff, and at Illin off our committees purely out of vengeance. Of course, just like much of what Swalwell claims, this was never true. Usually, I would ask a hypothetical question, when will Congressman Eric Swalwell, Democrat California, ever learn? But the truth is, he won't because he doesn't have to.
Swalwell is never held accountable for his lack of honesty, so he can lie as often as he wants. Nevertheless, no one should trust anything Swalwell says without verifying his claims. Tags, opinion, Tags. Beltway, yeah, confidential. Beltway confidential. That's all I got on that one there. Um, I don't have nothing to say on that. It's just a Democrat try, trying to kill, kill uh, Republicans. Give them a gun, they probably do it. Let's go to the next one. That's from the uh, new voice. Ukrainian military reveals garbage and ammunition left by invaders during retreat from Bakhmut positions. The positions, likely belonging to Russia's 72nd Separate Motorized Rifle Brigade, fled from Bakhmut, leaving behind 500 corpses of Russian invaders, according to the leader of the Wagner Mercenary Company leader Yevgeny Prigozhin on May 9. This was later confirmed by the 3rd Special Operations Brigade of the Armed Forces of Ukraine. According to the Ukrainian defenders, within two days, fighter aircraft in the Azov Tactical Group killed 64 invaders, injuring a further 87, and taking five prisoner. Several enemy ammunition depots, mortars, and several BMPs were also destroyed. Andrei Bailetsky, the commander of the Azov Tactical Group, which is part of the 3rd Special Operations Brigade, reported on May 10 that Ukrainian soldiers had defeated units of the 72nd Separate Motorized Rifle Brigade of the Russian Federation, liberated part of the territory of Ukraine, and taken invaders prisoner. Okay, and there's more to read on that, not a whole lot more. I want to read the rest of it. I'm going to go to the next one now. It's from uh, Benzinga. Jinping could exploit U.S. debt ceiling crisis, warns top Pentagon leaders. China describes us as declining power. and We are a declining power. Amid the ongoing debt ceiling standoff, top Pentagon leaders warned that a default would be a win for Xi Jinping, who describes the U.S. in his speeches as declining power. What happened? Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Joint Chiefs Chair General Mark Milley, during a Senate Defense Appropriations Panel meeting on Thursday, warned that if the debt limit is breached, it would cause significant harm to Washington's position on the global stage and raise concerns about the U.S. leadership. Amid the ongoing debt ceiling standoff, top Pentagon leaders warned that a default would be a win for Xi Jinping, who describes the U.S. in his speeches as declining power. What happened? Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Joint Chiefs Chair General Mark Milley, during a Senate Defense Appropriations Panel meeting on Thursday, warned that if the debt limit is breached, it would cause significant harm to Washington's position on the global stage and raise concerns about the U.S. leadership. Okay, that read it twice for some reason. I don't know why. Um, there's not much more on that. I'm going to the next one here. Just from Daily Dot. Bed, bath, and beyond scamming till the bitter end. Customers mock bed and bath beyond for closing sale prices. In April, home goods retailer Bed Bath and Beyond filed for bankruptcy and announced that it would be closing all of its remaining stores. To clear the locations, the chain placed closing sales on remaining merchandise, advertising a range of deals. One TikToker's foray into their local Bed Bath & Beyond to check out the prices shows an item was actually raised in price for the closing sale. Posted by user at Kickentiger, the video shows a price sticker on an advent calendar that appears to be stacked on top of another one showing a lower price. Okay, let's watch this video here. By now, everybody knows Bed Bath & Beyond is closing. So I went there today, I thought, hey, I'll check out these sales they got going on, see if I can find something. Look at this nice advent calendar. 35 bucks, no returns. Uh, there's something underneath here. What is it? Oh, it's 1050. See you later, Bed Bath & Beyond. So they actually raised the price. And there's more to read on it if you want to read the rest of it. I'm going to my next one here. But if you go to Bed Bath & Beyond, you know, uh, double check the price. See if there's any price hidden behind it. Because they'll raise the price trying to make money for their going out of business sale. For their Chapter 11 or whatever it is, bankruptcy. Let's go to the next one. This is from new, uh, the New Voice. 
Russia Defense Ministry claims U Ukrainian troops advancing along 95 kilometers contact line. According to the official, Ukrainian military units allegedly carried out 26 attacks involving more than 1,000 military personnel and up to 40 tanks and other equipment. Read also, Ukrainian military reveals garbage and ammunition left by invaders during retreat from Bakhmut positions. Konoshenkov claimed that the Russian forces had repelled all attacks and prevented defense breakthroughs. The commander of the Eastern Military Group of the Armed Forces of Ukraine, General Alexander Sursky, said on May 10 that the Ukrainian army had conducted an effective counteroffensive attack in the town of Bakhmut, Donetsk Oblast, pushing back invading Russian forces up to two kilometers at some parts of the front line. And see, there's a little more to read on that if you want to read the rest of it. And I'm going to my next one now. Uh, this from uh, investing.com. Coppers, China problem. Where could price go from here? Chinese inflation remains weak, raising concerns about the economic rebound. Price stagnation and falling prices in China indicate deflation. Copper could continue to head lower as demand in China hits a low point. Copper has a China problem. The world's second largest economy isn't rebounding as fast as many thought it would after abandoning all caution over COVID. And that is a problem for a metal that sees nearly half of its global demand out of China alone. The numbers are telling. Data out of Beijing on Thursday showed Chinese consumer inflation barely grew in April, while producer inflation sank to its weakest level since the peak of the pandemic in 2020. Charts by skcharting.com, with data powered by investing.com. Chinese trade data earlier this week was also disappointing, showing an economy struggling to pick up despite various stimuli put into place since the country turned its back on COVID lockdowns early this year. The unusual combination of price declines and unprecedented money supply in the Chinese economy has fueled talk of deflation. As the United States and many other countries desperately try to bring down inflation which is chipping away at living standards, China is doing the opposite in trying to grow its economy through higher prices. The seemingly paradoxical situation is logical to anyone who understands Chinese economic peculiarities. Economic uncertainty is prompting Chinese households to stash money into savings rather than go out to spend, and companies remain wary of making new investments. That's raising the specter of a tailspin of falling prices and wages from which the economy may struggle to recover. In a recent commentary, Raymond Young, chief economist for Greater China at ANZ Research, said. Our core view is that China's economy is deflationary. Yu Yongding, a former director of the Institute of World Economics and Politics at the CAS, concurs somewhat. You said in an article posted on the Chinese news site NetEase. In my opinion, although the statement, deflation has begun, is not necessarily accurate, it is not a big mistake. Calling attention to deflation is entirely correct. Insufficient aggregate demand is a prominent problem facing the economy. Prices are stagnating or falling in China despite the People's Bank of China, or PBOC, cutting interest rates and pumping cash into the financial system to bolster the economy, and despite the removal of strict COVID control measures late last year. Although China's gross domestic product expanded by 4.5% in the first quarter, that growth largely reflected the impact of pent-up demand among shoppers following three years of pandemic restrictions, Young added. Stripping that out, GDP growth would have been only 2.6%. Okay, and there's more to read on this if you want to read more about it. Let's see, I'm going to look at this chart here again. Uh, copper futures is down there and it went way up. Roller coaster ride. And then it's back down again. So I guess I mean copper be cheap for a while. I don't know. Anyway, let me go to the next one. It's from the Daily Caller. It's exclusive. House Homeland Security Committee Chair reveals he has evidence of Macoris, my, I can't say his name, potential uh, fraud. 
House Homeland Security Committee Chairman Mark Green revealed that he has evidence of potential fraud allegedly committed by Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas that could be grounds to build an impeachment case, he said in an exclusive interview with the Daily Caller News Foundation on Thursday. Green told the DCNF that he has confidential sources sharing information with him that purportedly shows that Mayorkas may have committed fraud, but he refused to divulge further details at this time. Several House Republicans, including Representatives Pat Fallon of Texas and Andy Biggs of Arizona, previously filed articles of impeachment against Mayorkas. We've got some people that are sharing some information with us that there's potential fraud, so we're going to look very hard at all of these things, prepare a packet, show it to the American people, and then if it warrants impeachment, we'll hand it off to Chairman Jordan. I think it will, based on the information I know, Green told the DCNF. Photo by Anna Moneymaker slash Getty Images The situation at the southern border is expected to worsen with the lifting of Title 42, the Trump-era expulsion order, Thursday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP, have already encountered more than 1.2 million migrants at the southern border in fiscal year 2023. I think if he fails to enforce the laws written on the books that in and of itself is enough for him to be removed. He is in the executive branch. He doesn't get to make the laws, we do, Green said. And if he can't enforce and live by the Constitution of the United States, why is he a cabinet secretary, Green added. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has yet to move forward with a formal push for Mayorkas impeachment. However, Green said he would be willing to build an impeachment case against the DHS secretary. I'm quite alright owning that responsibility in doing it, but, when we're done with that, and my gut tells me it's gonna be enough for him to not be in the job, Green said. In a statement to the DCNF, a DHS spokesperson said, Secretary Mayorkas is proud to advance the noble mission of this department, support its extraordinary workforce, and serve the American people. And this is a tiny bit more to read, not a whole lot. And let's go to the next one here. This is from the uh, Daily Beast. Fre federal judge injects 11th hour chaos into Biden's border policy. A federal judge in Florida, who happens to be an appointee of former President Donald Trump, temporarily blocked the Biden administration late Thursday night from carrying out a recently implemented parole policy that would allow the temporary release of migrants who have crossed the southern border illegally. The ruling from U.S. District Judge T. Kent Weatherell stands to inject a healthy dose of chaos into the country's immigration system just as a COVID-era policy, called Title 42, was set to expire. That expiration date, midnight on Thursday, to be exact, has generated significant controversy as record numbers of migrants from across the world have shown up on America's borders in the hopes of crossing before Title 42 is nullified. The policy was originally implemented in 2020 by the Trump administration on public health grounds and made it much easier for authorities to turn people away at the border and eject them once inside. Title 42, however, did not include any penalty for repeated attempts. In response to Thursday's expiration, the White House cooked up a parole system that would have prevented overcrowding in detention facilities by releasing migrants into the U.S. with the understanding that they must report to the Immigrations and Customs Enforcement Agency to begin the immigration process. Because the new policy does include punishments for those entering the country repeatedly after deportation, throngs of migrants have flooded border crossings in recent days, overwhelming authorities tasked with processing the new arrivals. Because of the mounting problems, the Biden administration argued strenuously that Weatherell leave its parole system in place, if only on an emergency basis. And there's more to read on that if you want to read the rest of it. I'm going to go to the next one here. It's from HuffPost. For Biden to keep debt limit off the table until the election, it will take a massive hike. To keep the debt limit off the table until after the 2024 presidential election would likely take the biggest single debt limit hike ever, according to forecasts by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office and the White House's own Office of Management and Budget. While the focus has been on whether the meetings between President Joe Biden and congressional leaders will keep the government from defaulting as soon as early June, there's been little public discussion of how big a hike will be needed to not run that risk before November 2024, potentially thrusting the already fraught debt limit debate into the heat of presidential and congressional campaigns. Time is ticking. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned the government could run out of money to pay its bills as early as June 1. But instead of having the second meeting between Biden and congressional leaders on Friday as planned, the meeting's postponement was announced Thursday. 
Staff will continue working and all the principals agreed to meet early next week, a White House spokesperson said. One of the leaders couldn't be there. They have a funeral they have to attend. They didn't think it would be productive. So we thought, let's do next week, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, Republican California, told reporters. Earlier in the day, Rep. Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat New York, the House Democratic leader, said staff-level meetings had happened Wednesday and were very productive. House Republicans insist Biden must agree to spending cuts before they will allow the limit on government borrowing to be hiked. The White House said it won't negotiate over the debt limit but is willing to talk about the budget separately. How those seemingly incompatible stances have been dealt with in the nascent talks is unclear. One and that's all I'm gonna play here. Um, there's more to read from if you want to read the rest about it. Anyway, the uh, meeting been uh, canceled until next week. We'll see what happens then. And here's my last one here from 1945. Two worlds, I mean, two words that could end the Ukraine war for good. Simple, a compromise. Can it happen? Can the Ukraine war finally come to an end? The Russo-Ukraine war has been raging for nearly 15 months. Prospects for peace in the near term are bleak, as Ukraine and Russia are in diametrically opposing positions. Can China solve the war? But one third party is being considered as a prospective peace broker. China, who enjoys better relations with Russia than most of the international community, and whose leader, Xi Jinping, recently called his Ukrainian counterpart Volodymyr Zelensky. I know I can count on you to bring Russia to reason and everyone back to the negotiating table, French President Emmanuel Macron told Xi last month. Macron speaks for a lot of us. But she was quick to temper expectations. The Russo-Ukraine war, which has featured the most vicious and wide-scale fighting on the European continent since the end of World War II, is seemingly intractable. Bringing the two sides together is a tall order, even for China, who recently helped to normalize relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia. But if the Chinese were to engineer a compromise between Ukraine and Russia, what might that compromise entail? Peace between Ukraine and Russia. Mediated by China. On the one-year anniversary of the war, China released a 12-point peace proposal. Within the proposal, China stressed explicitly that peace in Ukraine can be restored only through negotiations that ultimately reach a comprehensive ceasefire, The Guardian reported. Despite conventional wisdom, Beijing was not advocating a ceasefire that would freeze the current battle lines as new borders, an arrangement that would leave large swathes of Ukrainian territory in Russian hands, but rather the beginning of a political process that would ultimately lead to a permanent cessation of the fighting. China's peace proposal was silent with respect to territorial terms, which of course is fundamental to the nature of the conflict. But China, despite their ties to Russia, likely recognizes that Russia will not be able to achieve its territorial ambition in Ukraine, Russia's initial objective, to win the war militarily and to partition Ukraine, in the process, is no longer tenable. Instead, the fighting can only end through an agreement based on mutual compromise by the two parties, The Guardian reported. Mutual compromise on that scale will require a powerful mediator. Like China. China has significant ties with both warring countries and will need to toe a delicate line in order to not offend either. Beijing certainly wants to preserve its no-limits friendship with Moscow, but has been careful not to adopt a stance so favorable to Russia that Ukraine would be unwilling to accept China as a mediator. And you're going to read the rest of this in my description box. And that's all the news I got for you today. Hope I got some information for you. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, at least come back once in a while. And I thank you for watching. Until next time.